Welcome to Justice Matters. I'm San Francisco Public Defender Jeff Adachi. Justice for all is America's great promise, but does it deliver? Lady Justice may wear a blindfold, but statistics show that what happens to a person in our criminal justice system may depend on the color of his or her skin. Studies have shown that there are profound differences in how African Americans and Latinos are treated compared to whites. African American and Latino citizens are more likely to be stopped by police, searched, arrested, and convicted than their white counterparts. Recent killings of Michael Brown, Eric Gardner, Tamir Rice, and others across the nation have raised the question of whether police are held accountable. As our nation reckons with these long simmering issues, we tackle the question of how race affects the criminal justice system. With us today on Justice Matters are Kimberly Papillon, who's a national expert on race in the justice system, Contra Costa District Attorney Mark Peterson, and San Francisco State University Professor Davy D. Welcome. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Happy to be here. I'm going to start with you, uh, Kimberly. Tell us, is there racism in everyone? Well, we talk about this notion of racism, and racism, the, the technical term is really about systemic racism, this notion of how race affects our systems overall. But if we look at individuals, we're really talking about something called unconscious bias. Uh, assuming that somebody doesn't have a conscious value system where they genuinely believe that certain people should be treated differently, assuming that that's not the case, we recognize that most people have unconscious biases feelings or preferences or feelings against people that they don't even consciously recognize. They have no idea that they're harboring them. It could be based on age, it could be based on race, it could be based on gender or sexual orientation. And what we try to do is make people aware of the fact that they have these biases so that they understand when they might be acting upon them. And then we can start to work to erode those biases and eventually eliminate them. Now in the criminal justice system, there are a lot of judgments that are made do these biases affect our judgment? They do. So my area of specialty is in the neuroscience of these biases, um, uh, or the brain science, the discussion of that at least. And one of the conversations we have is what happens to the brain? What happens to the brain when someone sees a face of someone who appears to be African American? Um, does their brain have a different reaction than the, when they see someone for who, for instance, might be considered to be Caucasian? And we find there is a difference, that the brain reacts much more like the way that it would react to a spider or a snake when a person who is in the United States, who has been raised here all of their life, um, and primarily also if they are Anglo-American, we find that they're more likely to have a reaction that is a fear, anxiety, or distrust reaction in their brain, a neurophysiologic reaction to a black man's face more so than to a white man's face. And as that face becomes more Afrocentric, as that face begins to look more like Wesley Snipes or Shaquille O'Neal and less like President Obama, that effect increases. So we start to look at this notion of what is the brain doing that we don't even understand? And how can someone easily control what's going on in their brain if they don't even know the name of the part of the brain that is activating more for one racial group versus the other? Now, Mark, you've been a prosecutor for 30 years and you're now the elected uh, prosecutor of Contra Costa County. And recently, uh, you had issued a statement in response to some allegations that were made uh, saying that you did not believe that race uh, affects uh, decisions that are made uh, by your office. Uh, can you tell us why? Uh, yeah, the allegation was made that uh, individuals in our office or uh, our office as a whole, as well as the judicial system and the police officer and probation officers were engaging in, in racism, making or treating people uh, disparately based on their race. And I've been a district, deputy district attorney for 30 years. I've been the elected district attorney for 40 years. And uh, I have yet to see a case where anybody in my office has made a decision to charge someone or not charge someone, either based on the race of the accused or race of the victim. I've never seen uh, a judge do that. Uh, I challenge the public defender to name one case where it's ever occurred in the last 30 years in Contra Costa County, and I'm still waiting to hear from her. I don't I dispute that there are unconscious biases. I would agree that we all have those. Mm -hmm. uh, but as far as uh, individual uh, biases affecting charging decisions and how we prosecute cases, I haven't witnessed it. How would one go about proving that, though? Because it's hard to look into somebody's mind and I'm sure nobody wakes up in the morning in your office and says, you know, I'm, I'm going to go after this person or that person because of their race. Uh, but yet, uh, we'll talk about the statistics a little later, but I mean, it's, it's you know, a pretty profound 
what it shows. Well, what are your thoughts on how unconscious bias might affect uh, an individual prosecutor? Well, just explaining logistically how it happens day in and day out, let's talk misdemeanor cases. Our misdemeanor deputies get a stack of 50 cases that they've got to file in a certain period of time. They have to go through those cases and read the fact patterns and decide it. It would take quite a bit of time just logistically to look at the race of the accused and decide, okay, I think I've got to file on this person because they're black or Hispanic. Uh, just logistically, it's very difficult to do. Let's say somebody filed a case based on race uh, improperly. It goes on to another deputy DA, and that person, under this theory, might mm -hmm. engage in racism. But the likelihood of that is, is very unlikely. Uh, when we make offers on cases, we're in, a, we're in a chambers, as you know, as you know, with a judge going over perhaps 200 cases, and we've never even seen the race of the accused. They're out in the courtroom waiting for our offer. We make offers without ever seeing the race of the accused. That is the person offering the deal. And not, as you know, 95% of all cases are resolved by plea bargaining. So that would be the, the area where the most racism might occur, not in trials, but in plea bargains. So if we don't even know the race of the person that we're making the offer on, it's very difficult for me to understand how it could be this widespread, uh, either purposeful or even unpurposeful, uh, racism because they don't even know the race of the accused. What about the police and who the police decide to target? In other words, if the police disproportionately arrest black and brown people, wouldn't that necessarily mean that your office would disproportionately prosecute black and brown people? Yeah, I understand the logic there and that, that yes, the logic is there, that if that is being improperly done on that end, those are the kind of cases we get. But we are the checks and balances too. We don't just rubber stamp the cases. For example, uh, people don't like to get into the filing rate, but at my filing rate, I probably file maybe 50 to 60 percent of all the cases brought to me. So I don't rubber stamp what the police do. We don't, a lot of those cases, we don't ever even file. Uh, so uh, yes, there could be a problem on the police end, uh, but there are checks and balances. There's us, there's the public defender who can represent them, such as yourself. There's judges that can review the case. So there are a lot of protections. I'm not saying it's fail safe. But there's a lot of protections built into the system to make sure it's not uh, racist. Okay. Now let's look at some of these statistics. And uh, we actually didn't have anything from uh, Contra Costa County, but this is from San Francisco. It says that African Americans make up 6% of San Francisco residents and 56% of county jail inmates. In Alameda County, African Americans make up 12% uh, of the residents, but are 55% of the county jail inmates. And the U.S. Sentencing Commission found that federal sentences for black men are 20% longer uh, than for whites. Uh, David E., what do you make of these statistics? What's the real story here? Well, I mean, there's, um, <clears throat> there's a myriad of ways to look at it. The easy answer that people will just probably fall back on is say black people commit more crimes and that's going to be bolstered by news reports that they see every night. That's going to be bolstered by a slew of reality TV shows that target African Americans or Latinos and that's going to have people automatically think well they must be committing crimes. What I find and what I think often happens is that there is a, um, I'll call it selective uh, prosecution or selective enforcement of the law. So let's say you have a lot of people that are in jail because they did drugs or they have drug possession, et cetera, et cetera. I would want to know where they enforce that law. Were they on San Francisco State's campus, were they at the UC Berkeley campus, or they're out in Hunters Point. And the point that I'm getting at is that if you look at, if you want to use statistics, because I think statistics if you want to use statistics, you find that everybody's using drugs all across the board. There's a certain amount. But you all of a sudden find that there's one group of people that's going to jail for that, that drug involvement versus another. And that's where the story has to be unearthed. And that's where biases and all sorts of things come into play. I mean, another thing that you have to factor in is that sometimes people are very politically ambitious. So it's easy to go to the hood and make a show of, you know, making a lot of arrests, sending people to jail, have your stats raised up, and said, look, at a, look what a good job I did versus going to a more affluent neighborhood where you're gonna get some pushback, where you might be actually stepping on the toes of some of your colleagues or potential supporters. So you have that sort of bias that nobody wants to talk about. And we can go on and on down the list and look at all the different ways in which that plays out. But when you have these type of numbers and you find them all over the place, whether you're in California here in San Francisco or in New York or in Austin, you know, pick a city, they're pretty similar. And I just can't think that we can come to the conclusion that this particular group of people is committing crimes at 
much higher rates than everybody else, especially when you're looking at the type of crime that many people are going to jail for. And many of the crimes are drug possession, drug selling, all those sorts of things. And so I think you have to look a, a, a little bit below the surface. I mean, you know, one of the things that struck me is that if you look at the drug use of, say, white Americans and black Americans, it's, it's not that much different. Yet you find that the prosecution levels are much higher. And I did have that stat for Costa Costa. It showed something like uh, three or four times the rate of, of white drug use. And it's not, and it's not limited to Costa Costa. It's San Francisco is the same thing. I, I, Any I thoughts that, on that? I doubt that that's accurate because, uh. to my knowledge, they don't keep track of it, and that's one of the problems. We're all data driven, mm -hmm. which we should be, and the statistics really aren't there. I don't know what the racial makeup of the individuals are overall yeah. that we charge in our county, but in the mm -hmm. in the in the uh, country, uh, it, it is factually true that uh, African Americans are 13 percent of the population, but uh, blacks commit 33 percent of all the rapes in the country, 34 percent of all the assaults. 55% of all the robberies and 50% of all the murders. Now there's societal and other reasons that contribute to that. I don't think it's a racially biased justice system that does put those individuals in prison because of race, but it's based on the crimes that they commit. In I California, with that. Those, are, those are absolute yeah. facts. In California, for example, drug offenses. You know how many people are in prison for drug offenses in this state? It's 134,000 prisoners. 3% are there for drug, uh, drug possession. 4,300 people, 3 percent, 70 percent of everybody that's in prison in the state of California is there for violent crimes. Another about 25 percent are in there for property crimes, another 14 percent because they have prior serious felonies. So the people that are in prison, in California at least, and I'm not talking about the whole state or whole country, I'm not an expert in that, but in California, the people that are in prison are the ones that should be in prison. Kimberly, your reaction? Well, I would take issue with the statistics that were just provided. You can look at statistics um, that look at crime rates based upon convictions. Those are inherently, therefore, going to be skewed. And if there's racial bias in the system, there will be racial bias in the outcome of those statistical analyses. However, what you should look at instead is self-reports of criminal activity. Even if you go back to Bush era one or Bush era two statistics, U.S. household survey stats will show that, for instance, for drug possession with intent to use as opposed to um, simple possession as opposed to with intent to sell, you find extraordinarily similar numbers among African Americans and Caucasians for the percentage of each group from the ages of 18 to 24 who will actually use crack cocaine, powder cocaine, heroin, etc. Interestingly, though, there are seven times more Caucasian people who are between the ages of 17 and 24, or 18 and 24, and therefore what you wind up having is seven times more significant drug use in that age group, but far fewer being arrested or convicted. It is not true to say that African Americans are responsible for 33% of the rapes. It is true to say that African Americans are responsible for 33% of the rapes where police are willing to arrest and prosecutors are willing to convict. Many of the other rapes go unanswered and unspoken of because someone who is more affluent or has more power in the system or is not seen as the typical racist goes unwatched. And that's why we have this scourge that we're talking about now at our university campuses where everyone is having this discussion about how young white men who are at university campuses are not being prosecuted for rape. Why? Because those individuals have the affluence to be, be able to forego the system, so to speak. So those statistics actually enhance the mythology. They don't actually demonstrate the reality. Now, David, do you think that uh police target African-American men and why? I think so. I think that um, for there's a number of reasons why that can happen. A uh, long time ago, maybe about five or six years ago, there was a big round table of law enforcement, prosecutors, uh, activists, the ACLU was around government informants and the use of them. And that was a big problem because what you had was um, burn grants that the police depended upon was tied into the number of arrests that they could make. And you had former police, you had actually the police officers themselves, the guy who was co-creator uh, of The Wire said that he was under pressure as a detective to come up with a number of arrests, not the quality of arrests, but any arrests. So it didn't matter how serious the crime was, let me just get my numbers up. So if I'm driving around with some drugs, she happens to be in the car, he's in the car, everybody's going to get arrested. And we'll have to parse that out later down the road. Then you also have a situation where they would get somebody 
and this is what the round table was about with the with the government informants and ask them give me some names give me 10 names 15 names and you had case after case where people were just naming 20 and 30 people at a time the Tula Texas case is one uh, the movie American Violet is another one where that was the, probably the most egregious and so the point that I'm getting at is that you had economic incentive on the police to fulfill a quota that nobody wants to talk about and since you know, over the past few years since these topics have come up, we've seen former officers and current officers in, say, places like New York talk about the fact that they had, uh, they were under pressure to make sure that they get some numbers. So I think you have that bias going into uh, the situation. And then, and then, again, we come back to the political scenario. You know, we need numbers. We need to show that we're tough on crime. Who is most likely to not push back? Who's not going to have the resources to push back when you have these type of enforcements, uh, 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 unbiased and, and target enforcements going on? So you're going to go to particular neighborhoods as opposed to the college campus. So if we're talking about rapes again, for example, all throughout colleges, all around the country, the, the sexual assault thing has risen, but you don't see task force, you don't see multi-jurisdictional police actions on these campuses. You might get a notice, you might have a discussion in the class, but you don't have an all right, all out assault to make sure that stops. But in our community, anybody who's even remotely connected to a particular crime winds up being under the gun and, and caught up in, in that web. And so that, I think, is a problem. And Mark, do you think that's true, that uh, there are certain communities that are targeted maybe because of funds or, you know, there, there might be a uh, reason to focus on a particular community that results in more arrests? Well, I think communities are targeted because they're high crime areas. I, for example, became the DA of uh, Contra Costa County, 1.1 million people. I became DA and I said my priority is Richmond. Richmond in 2009 was the ninth most violent city in the country. 47 murders a year, so that's one murder a week. And I said that's a priority, we gotta help that community. So I've invested lots of time and effort of my own, my staff, I meet together with the Richmond Police Department, we started a ceasefire program. So yeah, we're heavy on enforcement on the criminals, the ones that are committing the crimes, uh, because we wanna reduce that crime rate for that prim predominantly African American community. And I happen to agree with, uh, you know, the black Harvard professor, Randall Kennedy, who said it does no good to pretend that blacks and whites are similarly situated with respect to crime rates or rates of victimization. They are not. And his position is, the, the difficulty is, the, the principal injury is that uh, there should be more enforcement of the laws in African-American communities that are uh, victimized by crime, not less enforcement. And black, I think the real tragedy is black teenagers are nine times more likely to be murdered than white teenagers. One out of every 21 black men can expect to be murdered. That death rate is higher than the death rate of American servicemen in World War II. We have a whole genocide going on of young black men. And we talk about these other issues, and they're important, but as far as the numbers, they are very small compared to these huge numbers of black victims. And that's what I think is the real tragedy here. Jeff, may I just jump in for a second? We often hear these sensational numbers and it, you know, makes for good TV and it's hard to refute, and especially when you have very little time because you can dissect all that and then go through what systemically is happening, et cetera, et cetera. But if you want to look at it from another angle, we, since, you know, pick a particular year, since the early 90s, we've had three strikes, we've had all this militarization of the police, we've had all these strict laws, all these different types of tools that have been able, that have been afforded to law enforcement that are supposed to bring down these murder rates and that hasn't happened in a, in a way that you would expect. You have to ask why, you know, what is going on, what is happening, what, what else is going on that you can arrest people, you can put them away in jail and you're, you're still having these numbers that you can tout out. And I would say that there are other things that you just have to look at. You have to look at, for example, uh, one who is actually committing the crime. So when you use these numbers, you get the you get the sense that everybody in a particular community is murdering folks. But if you look at the stats, you find it might be a very small percentage. So how come that small percentage is allowed to exist? And what sort of steps are being taken to prevent them from even moving in that direction in the first place? And you find that there's not a whole lot of resources uh, uh, dedicated to that sort of situation. So, for example, if you have, I think they said in Oakland, they said most of the violent crime a couple of years ago was committed by less than 10 percent, right? There was like this identifiable group. Well, the question should be asked, 
how are you dealing with that very small percentage of people? But instead what you have is you have the police targeting everybody. They're targeting the college student, they're targeting the churchgoer, and the whole community is being lambasted as one that is not concerned about crime, uh, two, doesn't want to tell on the people in their community, all these different types of things that put the onus on, if you follow his logic, the victims of these crimes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's right. sort of like the, the stop and frisk. Right. Let, let me ask you, ask you, Kimberly, going back to sort of the impact on the judicial system, you train judges on how to guard against prejudice. Can you tell us how racial bias affects judges? Absolutely, and, and and I'll say that also in the context of the um, statistics that were previously provided because they are deceptive. Um, for instance, we have clear statements, clear research that's happening over and over again where we can see that the change in race or a race, the race of the particular individual involved will be a dominant factor in whether or not that person is convicted, but even more importantly, and how long they wind up spending in prison. So when they go through and they pick hundreds of convicted felons, black and white, and they control for every factor that should affect how long you spend in prison, uh, the number of concurrent offenses, the seriousness of the primary and concurrent offenses, the criminal record, all those things that should count under any criminal or penal code. We find that there are significant differences between how long people are spending in jail for the same crime with the same mitigating and aggravating factors and the same criminal history. What are those differences? How can we, what do we attribute that to? Well, they then take the mug shots of the individuals, hundreds of individuals who have been convicted, and they actually track their faces along a scale for Afrocentric facial features. As the skin becomes darker, as the lips become more full, as the nose becomes broader and the hair becomes more curly. And they find that at every step along the scale, they get an increase. So we're finding an increase of seven to eight months. At every step along a scale of one to nine, for Afrocentric facial features, people are getting seven to eight months more in prison. That means the person who looks like Shaquille O'Neal is getting literally years more in prison than the person who looks like President Obama for the same crime. Put the races together and you're finding years more for the same crime with the same factors that are mitigating and aggravating and the same criminal history, you're finding people spending years more if their face looks more Afrocentric. We take this and we look at the neural correlates of it. We know indeed that the brain reacts differently to a black face versus a white face if you have a certain level of racial bias. Not just based on fear, but based on whether or not your brain can encode that person as fully human. The part of the medial prefrontal cortex that has to do that fails to do it ever so often. And so when someone says to me, well we don't know the race of the person, I say back, our statistics show us over and over again that there are just very few white Tyrone Jacksons out there. And so if you know the name of the person, you very likely can, uh, can determine the race of the individual. Uh, you can also look at the address, and that may be sufficient in certain neighborhoods. If we say Richmond, so to speak, is a place that we say, oh, that says Richmond, California, as opposed to Vallejo or Walnut Creek or some other area, then we can attribute certain racial aspects that are more versus less likely to that group. So I don't have to see the person face to face. I can actually have just a little bit of information and conjure up an image in my mind that will create a specific neurophysiologic reaction that will cause me to be more significantly, more, more I will call it, um, I will call it aggressive when I deal with prosecutorial decision making, sentencing, or the jury's decision to convict or acquit. Mark, one of the points that you made in your statement is that in Contra Costa County, there are actually 13% African American judges, which is larger uh, than the population uh, in your county. Do you think it makes a difference to have more African American judges and prosecutors? I don't know if it's the answer. It's always, it's always a good thing. Diversity is a good thing. Uh, we have more diversity in our office than is in the state bar. Of course, we pull from the state bar. For example, our office, I think 6% African American. The bar association, which is who we have to pull from, is only about 3%. So, yes, the more diversity you can have in your office or on the bench, I think that's a good thing. Uh, but addressing some of these things earlier, these statistics aren't uh, inaccurate. They're not deceptive. They're the facts. Uh, they're absolutely accurate. I would agree with the speaker who said, just like Mark Twain said, there's, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. And the difficulty with all these studies is to really look at, did the study really say that? You gotta fact check things because somebody can misrepresent things. Uh, I would agree the crime rate is down in many states. I don't know what the 
I just read a recent study that nobody seems to know. Criminologists disagree. Some think it's three strikes, but New York didn't have a three strikes law and their crime rate went down. So I don't know what the uh, reason is. Uh, that The allegation that police are targeting people, everybody in a community, uh, rather than one or two people, why would, we, why would they do that? Just logically, if you want to reduce crime, why would you target people that you know are not responsible for the crime just because they're black. You would want to go after the person that's committing the crime well, the uh, because you would reduce the crime. If I can okay, finish, go, go uh, then these studies, uh, we had uh, a study cited, but the study she's citing, uh, uh, correct, is a federal study. And the federal sentencings are much different. Uh, just like one side can cite one study that says there's racial bias in the system, I could cite five right now that say there is no racial bias in the criminal justice system. The RAND study from 1985. Those are state studies, by the way. Exactly, state yeah. studies, I'm which I really want. state studies. Yeah. yeah. And, we we and, could probably have a whole show on <laughs> studies. <laughs> We're probably not going to yeah, resolve this. Exactly, the exactly. But, but my, uh, my I, prosecutors aren't clairvoyant. They don't yeah. look at the name and think, oh, that's a black person. Oh, they're yeah. from Pittsburgh. They're a black person. They're from Clayton. They're uh, another race. Uh, that's just simply not true. We don't have the time to do it, don't have the desire to do it, and uh, we're not mind readers. And they are the most unique group of prosecutors in the nation and indeed the world. If they can show look at uh, the name, uh, I will show you a Love plethora of studies. But I will assure you, I will assure you, none. I will assure you that indeed, un uncommonly, there are very few people out there that don't have some type of bias. We are looking at, without exception, nationwide among people who are considered to be Anglo-American, 74% to 88.1% of the population showing some bias against African Americans on an unconscious level on the implicit association test. That's up to 88, 87.1% in the white population. 88% of white judges nationwide. You don't educate your way out of it. And you can actually educate your way into it. It is absolutely reasonable to say that you have no conscious bias. I would agree with you. I mean, you have the, no conscious the way bias. That, they at that the doesn't president. affect I mean, your you had a third making. of the people, white folks in, the, in this country, that thought the president was a foreigner, you know, that he was Muslim and all these negative things. And these are supposedly good old Americans with a degree and all that. But when these polls, if we want to go to these statistics, you know, you could pull it out and said, what is it, a third that thought, thought very differently of our president? And, you know, where's that coming from? Well, one bit of good news is that one of the studies showed that the way to correct for unconscious bias was to make the judges aware of the conscious bias, and they were able to correct their behavior. So that's one bit of good news. The thing we can't erase is just mm -hmm. this long history in the country of having laws that were very specific for targeting black and brown folks for the way we looked, the way we moved, all sorts of things going all the way back from Reconstruction all the way up to Jim Crow to all the covenants that you had in different neighborhoods. Even now, you go to Detroit, you start, you know, you go outside the border to some of the cities, and this is 2015, you're most likely to get arrested. They will find something on you. They will find something wrong with your car. They will find a vehicle uh, code violation. They will find, you know, you didn't pay your child support, anything. But you're going to get some sort of charge attributed to you. We found in Ferguson, all throughout St. Louis, all these municipalities that were making a, a gold mine off of people by targeting. So you have cities with 3,000 people but 15,000 warrants. Ferguson, 21,000 people but 24,000 warrants. Mm -hmm. This is obviously some sort of bias going on. This is not just facts. This well, may be some facts, but these facts are, are heavily weighed by people saying we're going to make some money or we're going to suppress a group of people and there's a political agenda, there's a social agenda, might just be plain old fear. But if you want to go to those facts, we can pull out all those type of numbers and say, well, well let's dispute these. Let's dispute what's going on in St. Louis right now with 91 municipalities, 41 of them being in the black areas and all these uh, warrants for people who have traffic code violations. Let's talk about that. How did this come about? And then when we get to that, then you start getting into some very ugly truths about people's way of viewing folks. And I think that's what we have to deal with. She said in the beginning, this is something that's systemic. It just didn't happen now, but it has a long, long history that, you know, we teach entire classes about where you go through the black codes, Jim Crow, and all that sort of stuff, that never was really resolved. That was never a race. That was never, you know, accounted for. There may be some good people that want to do better, but the, but the DNA is embedded in this country's way in which we police and the way in which we prosecute and the way in which we just look at people who are sometimes deemed different. Okay. 
On that note, I'd like to thank you all for being part of the show. I'd like to thank our guests, Kimberly Papillon, Davey D, and Casa Costa District Attorney, Mark Peterson. See you next time on Justice Matters. Thank you.